power of preaching. Our text this morning is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, a very familiar text. Here is the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, encouraging his young son in the spirit to preach the word. He begins to in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And the word for preach in that great verse comes from the Greek word keruso. It means exactly what we think it would mean. It means to, to herald, to proclaim, to publish. Of course, in this case, it's God's holy word. I've heard uh, many years in my life as a Christian that the old phrase that God had only one son and he was a preacher. I've also heard many times that the work of a preacher is just that. It is preaching. There are other duties that he is involved in, duties that every Christian is involved in. But the basic work of a preacher is preaching God's holy word. One of the five acts of worship that we will participate in this morning is preaching. If we are going to remain a true church of Christ, we must continue to follow every act, all five, on the first day of every week, in spirit and in truth. Paul told us to hold fast the form or the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1.13. No matter what some people teach, there is a pattern in the scriptures for us to follow. Why did God choose to use preaching as the method to spread the gospel of his dear son? Simply put, the gospel is a taught religion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, excuse me, Romans chapter 10, there is a passage of scripture beginning in verse 13 that tells us, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things as he sums it up there in verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes about by hearing God's word, not the words of man, not the teachings, the philosophies of man, not the commandments of man, but by the word of God. First question this morning with this first point the question is, is there a pattern of preaching in the New Testament? For those of us who have been members of the Lord's Church for many years, that might sound like a, a very simple, maybe even silly question. But I have known people who believe that there really isn't any authority for a preacher. Matter of fact, I remember one man in Denver many years ago who actually believed that, that there really wasn't any authority in the scriptures for a man to get up to preach. Funny thing of it was, he was a preacher. Now if he was truly convicted of his feelings of what he really believed, why was he preaching? Hopefully more than just for that paycheck. But as we know, according to the scriptures, even going back into the Old Testament, Preaching or teaching has always been God's method to get his word out to his people. You think about the Old Testament prophets. Well, what did they do? They prophesied. What, their own words? No, God's word to the people. For example, uh, Psalm chapter 40, verse 9, David wrote, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation." I believe this is a prophecy. I don't believe in this case David was writing of himself. I think he was writing about Jesus, about the Messiah. Another messianic prophet, Isaiah, 
Isaiah 61 verse 1 wrote, The Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Again, he is writing about the coming of the King, of Jesus, the Messiah. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He preached good things, good news, glad tidings, the, the euangelion, the Greek for the gospel in the New Testament. He preached it to the meek, those who wanted to hear. You think about Jonah. We remember the account of Jonah who really did not want to go to Nineveh. He hated them with a passion. And of course he knew that if he went and he preached repentance, that God would forgive them and he was right. God did when they repented. But here's the instructions in Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching, now watch this, the preaching that I bid thee. Not the kind that you might want to preach, Jonah, but my words. When we come to the New Testament, you think of individuals like John the Baptist who preached the importance of the coming of the king, the importance of repentance. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is at hand in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Kingdom, of course, as we all know, also being the church. Jesus, after his baptism, Matthew four seventeen, preached the same thing, the importance of repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, it's near, it's close. Not thousands of years in the future, but it was very close to being born that time. You think of Jesus choosing 12 disciples. Those disciples, before Acts chapter 2, was to preach about the coming of the kingdom, to preach the kingdom of God, Luke 9, 2. And we see the culmination of those prophecies through the Old Testament and of the New Testament prophets leading up to Acts chapter 2. Because what they preached in Acts chapter 2, the apostles and especially Peter in that great sermon was Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection to the Jews gathered in Jerusalem that day, the day of Pentecost. And the kingdom or the church was established on that great day. And even after the church was established, those who were preaching God's word were doing exactly that. They were preaching God's word, preaching the importance of Christ, of salvation through him about the kingdom. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to preach, teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts 5, 42. Even when the persecution came upon the early Christians in the city of Jerusalem, by Saul of Tarsus, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Acts 8, verse 4. Later on in that great chapter, we read about Philip, who went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Acts 8, verse 5. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Acts 20, verse 7. You think about the missionary journeys of Paul. Those three missionary journeys. Traveling the globe. What was the method that was used? Preaching of the gospel of Christ. That was the method that was used. That was what was taught. That was what was preached. Needed people. Needed apostles. Needed other New Testament prophets. Needed Bible class teachers, just like we do today. But what is to be taught, whether it was in the first century or the 21st century, is people to proclaim God's word, not their own. So preaching is still that method authorized by God to continue to spread the gospel of our precious Lord to a lost world. Go ye into all the world and preach. Preach what? Preach the gospel. 
Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Mark 16, 50. Matthew 28, 19, go ye therefore and teach all disciples. The American Standard Version has, instead of teach, to make disciples. And that's exactly what we were to do. Now, one thing we need to realize, if God had authorized preaching as an act of worship in the assembly only once, that would have been enough. If he had authorized preaching as a way, a mode, a method to spread his word to a lost world, even if it was done just once, that would be enough. But it is mentioned time after time after time, and we just stated just a few verses that point this out. As still the approved method of God. We need to realize whether man realizes it or not whether we sometimes realize it or not, preaching of the gospel is important to our Father in heaven. It's important to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's important to the Holy Spirit that gave us those words from the Father. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 21, Paul wrote, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, someone may look at that passage of Scripture and thinking, well, why is Paul referring to the gospel as, as foolish? Well, he's not. Now, there's no doubt that those early Greeks, just like many people today, think of the gospel of Christ as foolish. Even the Jews thought of it as a stumbling block. But to those who are willing to hear it with their ears, with the proper hearing and understanding, and will obey it and follow it, salvation will be theirs. They will be saved by it and nothing else. So is there a pattern of preaching in the first century church? Absolutely. Scattered throughout the New Testament. For us to continue to follow today. Second question. What kind of preaching is to be done though? And that's a very important question because a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of people in and out of the church don't want to understand this. So what kind of preaching does God demand? Sometimes in answering, answering a question, especially like this one, it's important first to answer the question of what kind of preaching does God condemn? So that's where we're going to go this morning. Preaching that is condemned by God. In today's age that you and I live in, and I do believe things are worse than they did a few years ago, I'm not a pessimist. I'm not negative. I don't care what my dad says. But I can see the signs of the times. I think all of us can unless we want to stick our heads into that sand like an ostrich. If you travel this country, you can understand the weakening of the church and the weakening of, of people not really caring to hear the word of God. But in our age, the word preach as well as preacher is bandied about to mean a number of different things. A preacher today with a lot of congregations and a lot of the denominations is anything but a preacher. Uh, he is an individual that works behind the scenes and does just about everything. And maybe, just maybe, if he has five or ten minutes that week, he will study to prepare a, a simple sermon, if you can call it a sermon. But maybe with them, five or ten minutes is enough, because that's probably about all the Bible you're going to get in that speech, is five or ten minutes. And with some, that's a lot. It should not be with us. As there is a difference between a preacher and a gospel preacher, there is a difference between preaching and gospel preaching. There's a lot of men who are standing up today who are preaching in pulpits. But standing behind this pulpit doesn't make me a preacher any more than a man sitting in a hen house will make him a chicken. 
It's preaching the Word of Christ. It's preaching the Word of God. And it is also, whether people want to hear it or not, it's preaching all of it. And it is for that individual who is preaching it to be living it before he begins to preach it. We can't tell someone else what they need to do when we're not doing it ourselves. They will not listen, of course. Go back to our text. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. Every time when I read that next phrase, to be instant in season, out of season, Brother Marshall Keeble's words come to me. And he basically stated that what that means is you preach the word when they want to hear it, and you preach the word when they don't want to hear it. We live in times where a lot of men are not preaching the word because the brethren don't want to hear it. You will lose your soul as a preacher if you do that. Now, I love every single one of you. But I don't want to lose my soul for you. In the time when I or someone else like Michael who is not willing to preach the word, then the best thing that we can do is sit down and do something else. Because we are portraying our Lord. But preach the word. Why? Because that's a command from God. You don't need any other answer. Don't need any other reason. But in verse 3 and 4, of course, we understand that there's some problems that were arising in the church. Still a problem today. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned into fables. That period of time even in my own life, came a long time ago. And I'm talking about specifically the Lord's Church. Doesn't make me happy to say these things. Makes me sad. But it is the truth. It should not surprise us that that is the problem with mankind. When you study the scriptures, one of the things that is as clear as a bell is that sooner or later, whatever period of time, patriarchal, mosaical, Christian age, mankind will sooner or later choose not to want to hear God's word. Just don't want to hear it anymore. Want to hear something different. I remember one sister in Denver, I've probably mentioned this before, I'm going to mention it again, but after hearing a gospel sermon, she told me, I've heard that all my life, I want to hear something different. It won't save your soul. And with that kind of attitude, she'll die lost until she repents and wants to hear the beautiful words of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you look at the book of Judges, you realize once again how a people were faithful for a period of time and then they would turn their backs upon God. The nation of Israel, the history of Israel in the Old Testament points that out time and time again. When you come to the New Testament, when you read about all these congregations, these churches that are mentioned in the great New Testament, sooner or later they would have problems. Seven churches of Asia. Only two did not receive any censor or condemnation from Jesus. Only two out of the seven. The Old Testament times, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10. Think about these words of Isaiah. This is the attitude of the people in Isaiah's day. Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us 
smooth things. Now listen to this last part. Prophesy deceits. In other words, lie to me. Make me feel good for an hour or two. And then let me go home so I can one day burn in hell. But that was their attitude at that period of time. Lie to me. Jeremiah 5.31 is a verse I memorized many years ago, even before going to school. And it is a haunting passage about the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. God, writing about his people, stated, The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so, and what will ye do in the end thereof? was their attitude. That's the attitude of a lot of folks today, outside of the church, without a doubt. In the church, sad to say that's the attitude of many. The preachers, well, they preach falsely. The elders bear rule by their means, a lot of congregations. And the members... They love to have it so. Now one thing needs to be said about that, just as it was with Judah. What will God do in the end thereof? Well, we know what he did with Judah. 586 B.C. it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's forces. Jerusalem, the temple, burnt to the ground. Those who hadn't already been taken away into captivity were just a small remnant were left behind to care for the land. What will God do with us if we have the attitude that they have? Destroy us in this lifetime? Possibly so. But definitely in the next, if we don't turn to Him. Brethren who want to hear something new are spiritually immature brethren. These are the ones that Paul wrote about in Ephesians 4.14 who are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the craftiness of men, by the sleight of hand, whereby individuals wait for them. That's the kind of Christian who really doesn't want to hear the whole unadulterated word of God. They want to hear fables. They want to hear feel-good stories. Read a passage or two from Reader's Digest, people who actually do that. Or have Andy Griffith on television on a Wednesday night for a Bible class. Speeches that amuse me, that make me feel good. Well, who doesn't want to feel good? But, of course, if you preach negative all the time, you're not going to feel good. Reprove, rebuke, also to exhort or to encourage. But if you want to talk about negatives, there's two negatives to one positive. However, like Michael stated a while back, and I completely agree with him, even a negative is a positive if you learn from it. When Lester Camp came to Aurora, Colorado, the preacher that they'd had for many years before gave them those feel-good speeches. And it wasn't very long after preaching the whole Word of God that some of the women said, He doesn't make me feel good. And I remember my dad saying, They're not used to hearing this. I give him two years. And two years they forced him out. That congregation is not faithful to today. So preach to me jokes, sentiments, experiences, flattery. Preach me the empty words of man. And then we have the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew 15, 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Don't think... 
that just because the Bellevue Church of Christ has been faithful all of these decades, faithful elders like we have now, faithful preachers like we have now, Michael being the preacher here, don't think that things cannot change because they can. When I attended the Memphis School of Preaching, I thought the Forest Hill Church of Christ was a great and godly congregation. It's no longer. You think about the Church of Christ in Denton, Texas. Do you remember the Pearl Street Church of Christ and all the good that they did? They changed. They're no longer faithful. Pearl Street isn't even Pearl Street anymore. So to think that we have to not be on guard so much, can let our guard down, that nothing bad can happen, is not learning anything. And when we have that mindset, then we're on our way to liberalism as well, or any other kind of ism that takes us away from the gospel. The preaching of philosophy, the wisdom of men, is, is condemned in the scriptures, as we all know. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed, Galatians 1, 9. Now earlier he said whether it was an apostle or an angel from heaven, if anyone came to the Galatians and preached something other than the gospel of Christ, what you had received, what they had received from Paul, that individual was to be accursed, or in the Greek, anathema. Now that's a scary word. Because what that really means is this an individual who's preached that. This man has been set aside for destruction. Set aside by God himself. That's what the word anathema means. Doomed to destruction. And not only is it important for the preacher to preach the truth, and the elders to demand that a preacher preach the truth, it is important for the members of this congregation or any church of Christ to demand that the elders make sure that the truth is preached and practiced. What about those who don't? What about those who are false teachers? You think about Second John 10. We're not to even receive that individual into our house. Neither bid him Godspeed. Why? Because then we will be a partaker of his evil deeds, Second John 11. Not in my wildest dreams would I believe that in a very short period of time, a span of time, that so many once faithful and conservative brethren would no longer heed those words in Second John that they would decide to continue to fellowship Apologetics Press, even though the director of Apologetics Press is a false teacher and has never repented of it. I never, you could never have told me that this is going to happen. How the Memphis School of Preaching would have went that way as well. Sixty-four preachers, I believe, who signed their names to that. Gospel Broadcasting Network, uh, Network going along with it. Florida School of Preaching. Other schools of preaching. Others once conservative, supposedly so, congregations. Most of my classmates, and when I say most, I mean most. Probably 90% if more, if not more. When an individual decides to continue to fellowship a false teacher, they become a partaker of that individual's evil deeds. What's one of those evil deeds? False preacher. False teacher. That's what they're guilty of. It's as if they got up there and they preached that false doctrine themselves. I don't care what they are doing now. They may be preaching the gospel. They may be standing for the truth in a number of areas. 
They may be involved in a lot of good works. They are still, until they repent, partaker of his evil deeds, and they're going to lose their soul for that. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, Romans 16, 17. Not fellowship them. You don't have to be some kind of a brain surgeon to understand that. That's pretty simple. Excuse me. Third point, and the lesson is yours. Don't grab your songbooks. The preaching that God demands. Let's notice that. Again, let's go back to our text. Preach the word. Look at that little word, the. T-H-E. It's a big word. A definite article. What that means is that is telling us there's nothing else to preach. Preach the word excludes everything else as we noticed earlier. Titus 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Second Timothy 1, 13, again, Hold fast the form or pattern of sound words. The word sound there means wholesome words, means healthy words. It's talking about the glad tidings, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second Timothy 2, verse 2, here, once again, Paul writing to Timothy. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So, Timothy, what you know, what you've seen, what you have heard me preach, on top of that, many witnesses have heard me preach. I want you to preach something different. Did say that. He said, the same. The same thing. What did Paul preach? He preached the word. He preached the gospel of Christ. And that's exactly what Timothy was to preach. And that is exactly what everyone who calls themselves a gospel preacher must preach. If you don't, you might as well be a chicken standing up here. Because you're not a gospel preacher. We understand that the word of a God is, is equated with truth. He shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. John 8.32. Free from what? The bondage of sin that people in the world are caught up in. Our Lord's words are the only spiritual nourishment that any of us need. That's all. You know, philosophies of man is fine to discuss somewhere else. But to spread God's word, that's not going to work. And it won't work in the pulpit during the Lord's day. Jesus stated, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John twelve forty eight. We're going to be judged by the words found in this New Testament. No other. We're not going to be judged by the teachings of man, the philosophies of men, feel-good stories of man. We're not going to be judged by the commandments of men, but by God, His commands. That's what we're going to be judged by. It behooves us then to know His holy words. And that's the only preaching that's going to save souls, Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and to salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The, there's that definite article again. The power of God. In other words, it is the only power by which mankind can be saved. Power of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
But he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. When Paul came to Corinth, you think about their traditions and their philosophies of men and wanting to sit around like in Athens of just hearing new thoughts from people. He did not come, as he stated, with the flowery words of man's wisdom. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he, he told them what he came to them with. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was it. That's all he needed. Because that's what was going to save him. And these are words that are precious and beautiful and important because they're from God. Verse 12 and 13, he points that how that came out. Especially there in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, which that what they had before, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It was imperative that they understood that what he was coming to them with was God's word, not man's. They were used to man's words. But they were hearing God's words. Power of God unto salvation. All scripture. Is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect or complete. Truly furnished into all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, every word, and every verse, and every chapter, and every book. Inspiration, which means God breathed. God breathed these words to men like Paul, who wrote them down for us to follow today. So we always have the God breathed words with us. And all we have to do is follow them, to obey them. Not only will it save our own souls, but it will save those that we teach as well. Which is what Paul's telling Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 16 as well. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. But whether it was Paul, whether it was Timothy, whether it's us today, before you can teach someone else, you have to be living it first. It doesn't work any other way. Paul gave this same exhortation to Titus in Titus 2, verse 7 and 8. And last but not least, to be a gospel preacher, you need to preach all of it. Not just sermons that won't step on somebody's toes. Even though I don't know of any gospel preacher worth their salt who looks forward to stepping upon someone's souls. Especially when you're aiming for their hearts. But sometimes that will happen when you preach the whole word of God. In his last address to the Ephesian elders, he stated just that. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Can you imagine someone keeping something back that's going to be profitable to a brother or a sister to help them get to heaven? And then in verse 27 of that same chapter, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He knew that that was his duty. If he did not do it, he would be held accountable by Jesus himself, who sent him to preach. He would be guilty. In closing, God did choose what some people refer to as the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's the method. Whether it's in the assembly on the Lord's Day and preaching, or whether it's at home, sitting across from some coffee table from someone else and teaching them the Word of God. The preaching, the teaching, and what needs to be preached, what needs to be taught is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else will do. 
hearing some feel-good story. The commandments of men may make you feel okay for an hour or two, but it will not save our soul. It will not prepare us for the day when the Lord returns. Our prayer as members of this congregation, our prayer to God, that all of us, preacher, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, all of us as members of the Lord's church here will demand that the word of God be preached, taught, practiced. That is what our prayer to God should be. And if that is going to remain the same after all these years, it will be up to us to demand of it. Do we all feel that way? Do we all feel that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation? If not, should we make those changes that we need to? We're going to be judged by the words in this book, John 12, 48. Should we be obeying those words? Are we? Have we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do we believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are we ready to repent of our sins? Remember, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. Are we willing to, as we notice in Bible class, to stand up, Matthew 10.32, and confess Jesus before others as the Son of God, and to be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38? If not, why not now? As New Testament Christians, if we have fallen away, understanding if we leave this building this morning and we don't come back, something terrible happens and our life is taken, or the Lord returns, we're going to die lost. Why not do something about that as we stand and sing?